This hour, NASA is revealing its new supersonic jet that flies without producing loud sonic booms. It's called the X-59, and the agency and its manufacturing partner, Lockheed Martin, are framing this as the next revolution in commercial travel. Okay, that's cool. NASA says that eventually this technology could cut some air travel times in half. Here is that unveiling that happened just moments ago. Okay, pretty fancy. So for his reaction to NASA's new experimental jet, we've reached Ian Boyd. He's a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. First off, let's just explain. This could be the future of commercial travel, but that one's just a two-seater. <laughs> right. So it's a, it put it, with it being in the X-59, the X stands for experimental. So this is NASA's way of, you know, testing out some of the technologies that would be needed for, for you and I in the future to, to fly on a supersonic aircraft. I think to sum it up, I, I was reading what you were uh, telling our producer. It would go, if, if, you know, we can get to the commercial, it would reach speeds of 925 miles per hour. That's uh, how fast it would go. A single aisle passenger jet right now is 550 miles per hour, but that's not all they have to work out. Right. So this the, the, the primary goal of this particular aircraft is to reduce the uh, sonic boom that was uh, talked about. You know, sonic boom is a very loud noise that reaches the ground from the airplane. So you could be, you know, sitting in your backyard enjoying a quiet afternoon. And if a supersonic aircraft flies overhead, you would get this really sudden jolt that would, you know, shake you out of your chair. And so that's what NASA is really trying to address with this program. Yeah, um, because right now they can only fly those over the ocean. Is that correct? Because of that sonic boom? Yeah. Exactly. So the U.S. has a ban and, and maybe Canada has too. Um, you're not allowed to fly supersonic aircraft over the land uh, because of this sonic boom phenomenon. And so this would you know, greatly open up the, the air routes that supersonic aircraft could be used for. Let me just, I want to go back to something I was just saying about how fast it could potentially be, which is uh, 925 miles per hour in Canadian terms, just for our audience, that would be 1,500 kilometers per hour. Um, so you mentioned the sonic boom from that. How much quieter is the noise from this experimental plane? Yeah, they describe it as being um, a thud and, and really something like um, a door, a car door being slammed. So they've tried to reduce it down to the sort of noise that we all experience, you know, just in our everyday lives that we wouldn't really pay attention to. And so if they were able to achieve that, I mean, I think that that is a big deal. Uh, what other obstacles need to be overcome before supersonic jets can re reach the commercial market? Yeah, I think one of the main ones is takeoff and landing, that uh, even before you get to the supersonic speeds, the high speeds that you were talking about, you obviously have to take off from an airport and you have to land at an airport. And the engines of these supersonic aircraft historically have been very, very loud. And um, so that's a, that's a main challenge because um, at the same time as these supersonic aircraft are being developed, just regular airplanes that we already fly in um, have become quieter. And, and so regulations have actually reduced the amount of noise you're allowed to make. And so that makes it even harder for supersonic aircraft. It's like the goalposts have been moved. Um, these are noisy aircraft. It's going to be challenging for them uh, to be quiet enough um, around airports uh, to be able to be brought into commercial service. So I think that along with sonic boom, just the general noise that these aircraft make 
is a challenge that has to be overcome. When do you think you or I could buy a ticket for a supersonic flight? Well, I think there's, you know, technology challenges to be overcome. There's there's regulations to be uh, thought about. Um, you know, the real value of these aircraft is uh, flying over long distances. So um, so there's international considerations. Um, the economics is something to be thought about, too. These are, you know, the tickets for these aircraft are going to be at, at least initially higher than regular aircraft. So, um so, you know, a number of different types of challenges to be overcome. So I think it's going to be at least a decade before people like you and I could um, could buy a ticket for an airplane like this. I hope this doesn't sound like a, a dumb question, but when you get on board one of these, would it feel different as a passenger? Well, not really, because the, you know, the, the acceleration, the change in the velocity uh, of the plane is relatively slow. Um, you are flying higher in the sky. Um, uh, but again, I don't think you would really uh, feel any differently. And so I think you'd be excited because you're being told that you're flying, you know, really, really fast. But I don't think you would really experience that yourself. Maybe just looking out the window? Well, you're, you know, because you're up in the sky, um, it's hard to, you know, there, mm -hmm. there, there's no reference frame, right, to, to compare to how fast you're, you can't really see the ground. So, um, you know, maybe, um, but um, like I said, I think you, you wouldn't really notice any difference. Okay, I look forward to potentially buying a ticket to one of these in 10 years. What about you? Yeah, it would be, uh, I, I wish I'd had the chance to fly on the Concorde when it was flying. Um, yeah. I'd love to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Ian Boyd, what an interesting topic. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Ian Boyd is a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder.